um, life in Afghanistan under the Taliban. Taliban leaders are claiming they have taken control of the Panjshir province. That was the final stronghold of resistance forces that were left in Afghanistan. And this morning, CNN is getting its first look at life outside of Kabul under Taliban rule. And Nick Robertson is joining us now with that. This is really the story. In fact, it's kind of the unseen story of what okay, is happening outside of the capital for Bring Afghans, Nick. Inside the new Afghanistan, in rural Pagtika province, far from Kabul, the Taliban's provincial governor has called a meeting. No women to be seen. Local village elders and tribal chiefs listen. A young boy takes a selfie. Much has changed since the Taliban were last in charge. Smartphones and social media. But poverty, still the country's biggest problem. We have many expectations and we are praying the Taliban will deliver. The week after Kabul fell, a local journalist took a road trip for us to see what was happening outside the capital. <laughs> Taliban guides showed him the way. At the border, changes already underway. Part charm offensive, giving traders what they want, longer opening hours at the border, and part crackdown, keeping men and women apart. Let me tell you, before we had one single line for both men and women, now we have two. They are kept apart. Pakistani officials easing into the new relationship, backing the segregation. On this journey, two things become clear. Afghanistan's near financial collapse and the hard switch to religious rule. Okay, that doesn't sound progressive. No shit. Guys, if you thought that these fucking fundamentalists were going to be <coughs> progressive, I mean, you have another thing coming for you, dude. Yeah, obviously not. Like, I hope you don't misunderstand. When I'm covering the Taliban, I'm not saying they're like beacons of progress. I'm simply stating that women in Afghanistan are forced to deal with shitty alternatives regardless of who's in charge. And it's basically harm reduction at this point to, to, to get the United States to evacuate and withdraw their forces so that there is more regional stability under yet another oppressive, incredibly oppressive and horrible and fundamentalist regime. Spotting a crowd, the team stop. Following the Quran fundamentalist is not a following of the Quran, okay? All matter of religion is subject to interpretation. If you think that like these guys are following the Quran to a T, then I guess you think the Westboro Baptist Church is following Christianity to a fucking T, but maybe you're an r slash atheist, or Reddit atheist Andy. Come on, how, how was women's faith the same before? It should have been much better. No. Especially for women living in uh, areas like this outside of Kabul, their lives were fucking worse overall. They still had Taliban control. There was constant fucking fighting. And then sometimes dudes that are decked out in like American camo would come in, break their fucking doors down and just rip into the houses. So no. It wasn't better overall. Their lives were fucked across the board. At least it's not a war zone now. On top of the religious fundamentalism. Motherfuckers think like America was, uh, I don't know, a beacon of progress in the country when we killed 72,000 civilians in Afghanistan. That's crazy. It's a provincial courthouse. Inside, local leaders careful to praise the new boss. We used to have to go a long way to get to a Taliban court, he says. Now we have one right here. The new judge in town, quite literally, laying down the Taliban law. Their interpretation of Islamic law. See, even... Bro, even fucking CNN's exclusive reporter is saying their interpretation of the uh, Quran. Except chatters in here are like, no, that's the only interpretation. 
so strange that like so many Muslim countries don't follow that interpretation, but hey, what's up? We asked the previous judges how they used to work. They said they were following the law of the land, not the Sharia. Yeah, I love when homies wear gold watches, which is literally not something you can do as a male in Islam. It's haram to wear gold watches or gold uh, jewelry as a male. In Islamic Emirate, all court proceedings. Hassan, what is jihad exactly? Really curious as a Muslim. Jihad just means struggle. It can mean struggle uh, against emancipation. Or it can mean fucking, uh, yeah, really curious, just curious, Andy. Or it can mean whatever these fucking psychos interpretation of jihad is, which is like spreading Islamic fundamentalism all around the world. Are according to the Sharia law. Under Taliban rule in the 1990s, the Taliban's Sharia law led to public amputations for thieves, stoning of adulterers, even hanging. But in the local market, Sharia law is not the big concern. It's making a living. Business is very bad. We don't know who is in charge. Only low rank people are here. We don't know if we can trust them. They are not telling us anything, and the situation has not improved. Prices are going up. In the barber's shop, business is down. It's not only me, he says, but business is bad in the market. It's not as good as before. They're not alone. The local pharmacist is also struggling. Stocks already depleted under the last government. The clinic's maternity nurse, also worried about finances, says the previous government didn't pay her for the past four months and she can't afford to go home. Closer to Carl. Wait, I'm confused. The previous government didn't pay, uh, didn't finance the maternity ward? Wait, how could that be? That was the American puppet government that literally fucking... Wait, how could that be? That's so strange that the previous American puppet state was uh, also not doing great by the women in, uh, in, in faraway regions of Afghanistan away from Kabul. That's so strange. Kabul, another doctor, more problems. Day and night, he says, we get 25 to 30 patients. And we have just one doctor and one nurse for them all. Outside the hospital, the Taliban claim an alternate reality. Before you didn't know whether the doctor was coming or not, but now they are there for you all the time. On this trip, the Taliban's prioritizing of Sharia law and bits of charm offensive seemingly missing Afghans' most important needs, a secure livelihood. And that's what's got countries like Pakistan on the borders of Afghanistan worrying. Quite simply, if there is an economic success, if the Taliban can't run the country properly and, and uh, provide for everyone's living, then all those people or a lot of those people are just going to come to the borders, try to get into Pakistan and the other countries, possibly make it on as refugees uh, to Europe. And that's a destabilizing influence here. And Pakistan says it just can't afford it. And they can't afford it. So what are they doing there, Nick? Well, the Pakistan's uh, head of intelligence, the ISI chief, went to Kabul to meet with the Taliban on Saturday. He came back, you know, uh, we didn't get an accurate description or a full description of what he was doing, but that's where we learnt about some of the problems that the Afghan government is having uh, in deciding who should run the country or the Taliban, the Taliban are having problems. Apparently, they've got military commanders who are disputing about who should be the defence minister. There are other issues in there as well. You know, Pakistan's sort of trying to be the diplomatic middle ground at the moment, uh, hosting, I think it's the Italian foreign minister today. They had the British, the Germans, the Dutch foreign ministers all last week. So I think that when you see what the Pakistanis are doing, and yesterday having a virtual summit with all the neighbors, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Iran. <laughs> they literally had the head of ISI in Kabul. I wonder what he was doing. The head of the Pakistani intelligence uh, was in Kabul doing meetings. I was just probably chilling. 
China as well uh, on that virtual summit. They're really trying to get a diplomatic initiative going, which, which really says engage with the Taliban, the international community. Uh, but at the moment, there, the, there's no real evidence that's happening. And when you have planes sitting on the runway in Masary Sharif, uh, people who are trying to get out, and the Taliban had agreed to that, not able to get out, it's all, you know, it's just raising the stakes and raising the concerns. We're going to talk about Masary Sharif in just a second, Nick. Um, with the emphasis on Sharia law, from the Taliban. Any sense from the people you've spoken to or the sources that we still have inside the country what the situation is for women in some of these outer provinces? Yeah, I, I, you know, look around that big crowd. That's what struck me. I used to go into Afghanistan when the Taliban were in control in, in the late 90s, and women were just sidelined from society. You look around that big crowd at the beginning of our report there. Not a woman to be seen. The Taliban just don't want to see them uh, really engaging actively in society. Yes, they say they'll get an education, but the strictures they're putting on education now, they're saying that uh, girls will have to go to separate classrooms to boys in schools. They'll have to wear sort of full black covering. Um, if their classrooms are small, they can put a curtain in the classroom between, boy between boys and girls. So they're really marginalizing the role of women that has done so much to come along in the past 20 years. The small protests over the weekend by a group of can we stop pretending that Islam is a modern religion? Yeah, that's why um, there's like eight countries, eight Muslim countries have had like female leaders before the United States of America because of how because of how fucking anti women and how anti modern they are, including Turkey. I didn't know your hat chat had so much anti Islam sentiment. What the fuck? Welcome to America, my friend. Welcome to the fucking West, dude. That's 20 years of anti-Muslim uh, radicalization that you have to work to undo. Stop calling Turkey a Muslim country? Yeah, dude, you're right. 95% Muslim, 99 by certain estimates. But hey, guess what? Because there's like 5% agnostics in the country now, according to some estimates, it's no longer a Muslim country. It is an overwhelmingly majority Muslim country. They are progressive. Okay, with respect to Afghanistan. For the chatters who are questioning women heads of state, <laughs> Elizabeth II, Queen of Pakistan. Okay, that's not what I was talking about. I was talking about Benazir Bhutto. In Bangladesh, uh, Khalida Zia, Tansu Chilet in Turkey, as I've talked about before. Prime Minister of Turkey in 1993, bro. Where's Hillary Clinton breaking that glass ceiling? One day. Sheikh Hasina in Bangladesh. Senegal, Indonesia had one. Megawati, Sukar, Sukarno Putri. I'm fucking that up. Kyrgyzstan had one. Anyway, yeah, I live in Indonesia. There's plenty of Muslim women leaders. I mean, it doesn't matter if you're, if you're like, all, if all you care about is like girl boss feminism, neoliberal feminism, then numerous Muslim countries beat America by that metric. You understand that, right? So shut the fuck up. If you're gonna hit me with some like dumbass uh, girl boss feminist, uh, neoliberal girl boss feminist uh, metrics, then I'll flip that back on you and show you that like even from those dumbass metrics that you want to fucking that you want to put you're wrong call back voices shana tova to all my jewish comrades in the chat hostel may all of you have a happy and healthy new year 89 <laughs> percent, not 99 percent. man shut the fuck up okay it literally changes depending on what study you look at i didn't say 99 i said 90 originally and then i also said 95 and then I also said it changes depending on what fucking what study you look at. Part of the problem with like actual fucking studies coming out of Turkey is that a lot of people are genuinely scared of giving accurate answers. Okay. There is a big growing agnostic movement in Turkey, like very big. But even someone like myself, 
I still have Muslim on my fucking card, on my identity card, which they, I guess, shifted now. On my e-identity card, it says Islam, much like many of the people that live in Turkey. It's like the default religion. Do you even do your research? Yes, I do. There is a 99... You said 99, but I took that as an intentional hyperbole. No, there are studies that say 99% of Turkey is fucking Muslim. I, ha I did say that. Islam is the largest religion in Turkey, according to the state, with 99.9% .9 of the population being initially registered as a state as Muslim. For anyone whose parents are not of any uh, officially recognized religion, and the remaining 0.1% are Christians or adherents of other officially recognized religions like Judaism. You understand? Chatter's arguing with a Turkish man. I know. I just like. I literally mentioned all of this. He didn't read his own link. Yeah, I, I can't believe he fucking sent me a link and like didn't read it himself. And guess what, motherfucker? 90% Muslim country has a public health system and you can get fucking abortions, dude. So I guess, you know, had a fucking, if abortions and like women in leadership are the only metrics for feminism, for girl boss feminism, and of course, denial of those two things are indicative of how fucking reactionary and backwards your goddamn country is, America. Turkey, by those metrics, are more progressive than the United States of America. But what's up? It's all... Yeah, we have fucking sex work. Turkey has legal sex work. Government-assisted, government-funded, literal brothels, dude. These are, these issues are incredibly complicated and trying to reduce them to like dumbass fucking understandings is, is, is silly. No porn though. <sighs> For abortion stats, Middle East is better than some states here. Alabama, Iran, or Saudi Arabia. We checked where abortion laws are better for women. Laws in many Muslim-majority countries in the Middle East are actually more lenient than those currently being pushed in some U.S. states. Harrods, fines. I, I don't have full access to it, so I can't read this, but... Address this? How come all the terrorist organizations are Islamic? Wait, really? I didn't realize the Ku Klux Klan was an Islamic terror organization. I didn't realize the fucking Republican Party of the United States was Islamic. The word you're looking for is fundamentalist. Not Islamic, you fucking idiot. Especially in a country like the United States, which I suspect you don't live in. Because if you did live in the United States, you would recognize that more than 75% of the uh, terror attacks that have occurred on U.S. soil, domestic terror attacks, since 9-11 were committed by white supremacist, far-right anti-government extremists. I guess they're patriots, though, so it doesn't matter, right? Muslim majority states that allow abortions in more cases than Alabama, Tunisia, Turkey, Algeria, Jordan, Kuwait, Morocco, Qatar, Bahrain, UAE, Saudi Arabia. But most terrorist attacks are committed by Islamic fundamentalists. It's not true. That's not true. Even if you recognize terrorism in the American understanding of what terror is, which is simply a designation for any non-state actor that the United States has declared to be bad and wrong and against the U.S. interests. Even on, even on that front, white supremacists are significantly better at doing terror in America than any other fucking like, Muslim fundamentalist group ever could. The definitions of terrorism exist to justify the state's monopoly on violence and also erode habeas corpus uh, rules so that you can fucking uh, unironically terrorize whoever the fuck you want.
But those aren't considered terrorists, dude. Those are just patriots, brother. Yeehaw. It's never an act. If it's never an act of terror, if a white supremacist literally writes a manifesto and says, I'm going to go murder some fucking people because I believe in, uh, you know, a white ethno state and you don't declare that to be a fucking act of white supremacist terror, then hey, guess what? That's just the patriot doing patriotism a little bit more than other patriots, right? Then you can live in this delusional reality that you have conducted for yourself, that you've crafted this perfect narrative where terrorism just means you're brown. And the more brown you are, the more terrorist you are. That's the fucking reality. But even according to our intelligence communities, the escalating terrorism problem in the United States has grown since 9-11 to heavily feature white supremacists, anti-government, far-right extremism. It is so much more successful than uh, Islamic fundamentalists committing acts of terror. The amount of fucking people that still, to this day, consider what happened on January 6th to be good and right and correct when you could consider that to be an insurrectionist act of terror with the same exact fucking metrics is mind-boggling. And there goes... There goes the fucking definition of terrorism. It is endlessly expansive. And, uh, and, and you can fucking literally consider most things that the Republican Party does to be terrorism. The irony is that someone just brought up motherfuckers were trying to kidnap and kill a governor and they were brown, not Muslim. They were not brown nor Muslim. Yeah, the irony there is that the Michigan governor kidnapping plot was uh, eerily similar to the way that the FBI used to deal with, uh, you know, Muslim teenagers with autism and intellectual disabilities, you know, just to urge them over the internet to like commit an act of terror and then supply them with the uh, tools only to arrest them in the end and uh, get a quick W on the board. If you look to what the FBI used to do under the Obama administration, under the Bush administration, the types of entrapment that they engaged in with like young Muslim, uh, young Muslim uh, uh, kids on the fucking internet, they're, they're doing the exact same shit to white supremacists and like white dumbasses now. So 60 years of history by the FBI is just horrific. Wait, what the fuck? How do I find that? Literally just Google FBI entrapment, Muslim teenager intellectual disability. We still don't know what caused... We still don't have the full details on the anthrax attacks, too. The Herald Square bomber who wasn't. After 9-11, U.S. authorities used informants to secure hundreds of terror convictions. But did they help create plots where none existed? The answer is yes. And this is the fucking New York Times, by the way. Like, not even... You know, not even one of those... uh Terrible... Terrible outlets like The Intercept. Developmental disability, not intellectual. Okay, sorry. For the record, they did this to continue galvanizing the public into overlooking the erosion of civil liberties in the form of the Patriot Act and numerous other ways in which we militarized our police force. I was looking at the 9-11 footage on that documentary and what struck me as so odd is it happened 20 fucking years ago was how non-militarized the police force was. It was wild. Wild seeing cops look like, I mean, look less kitted out than like security guards at the mall. I'm old enough to remember that Barack Obama at one point said that it is an abysmal, horrible thing to have a top-secret prison facility 
in an area that's not even on U.S. soil. Where we extrajudiciously throw random people that we've decided are terrorists and torture them for extended periods of time. I'm old enough to remember he ran on closing that facility. The glaring exception to this time-tested approach is the detention center at Guantanamo Bay. The original premise for opening Gitmo, that detainees would not be able to challenge their detention, was found unconstitutional five years ago. During a time of budget cuts, we spend $150 million each year to imprison 166 people. Almost a million dollars per prisoner. And the Department of Defense estimates that we must spend another $200 million to keep Gitmo open at a time when we're cutting investments in education and research here at home and when the Pentagon is struggling with sequestering budget cuts. But once we commit to a process of closing Gitmo, I am confident that this legacy problem can be resolved, consistent with our commitment to the rule of law. And I know the politics are hard. But history will cast a harsh judgment on this aspect of our fight against terrorism and those of us who failed to end it. Imagine a future 10 years from now or 20 years from now when the United States of America is still holding people who have been charged with no crime on a piece of land that is not part of our country. Look at the current situation where we are force feeding detainees who are hold, being held on a hunger strike. I'm willing to uh, cut uh, the young lady who interrupted me some slack because it's worth being passionate about. Is this who we are? Is that something our founders foresaw? Is that the America we want to leave our children? Our sense of justice is stronger than that. I'm old enough to remember he also talked about and defeated Hillary Clinton in the marketplace of ideas by saying Hillary Clinton was a warmonger and that he was against the Iraq war and was actually going to pull out of the Iraq war only to facilitate a troop surge in Afghanistan, of course. And to never actually follow through on prosecuting those who ended up torturing people literally torturing people under the CIA program. Sorry, engaging in enhanced interrogation. Like waterboarding. Practices that still continue in black site facilities in uh, Turkey and Egypt to this day. Practices that were found to be completely horrible. I'm old enough to remember that those practices were justified in TV shows that you watched all around at the same time, like 24. Awful lot of fucking intelligence community members in TV shows were just torturing motherfuckers. So weird. Old enough to remember that he droned an American and extrajudiciously murdered an American citizen and his family. I'm also old enough to remember that Donald Trump ended up murdering that person's sister in a similar drone strike. Bombed a hospital in Kunduz. I'm also old enough to remember that Obama only apologized for murdering white people in drone strikes. And no such apologies ever came for Pakistani or Afghan civilians that were also murdered. 72,000 to be exact over the course of the 20 year long war. Not just drone strikes, but numerous other uh, victims of conquest. Also old enough to remember that Barack Obama joked about drone striking the Jonas Brothers. It was just a, it was just a thing that you could joke about. The Jonas Brothers are here. They're out there somewhere. Sasha and Malia are huge fans. 
but uh, boys don't get any ideas. <laughs> I have two words for you, predator drones. <laughs> you will never see it coming. <laughs> you think I'm joking? Yeah, he did. He said he was going to drone strike the Jonas Brothers at the White House Correspondents' Dinner. Someone born post 9-11, can you explain the Patriot Act to me? The Patriot Act allowed Ameri the American government to just ma engage in mass surveillance of all citizens in a single, with a single fucking signature. It completely eradicated the privacy that you previously may have had under the law. It also established the Department of Homeland Security and also ICE. Previously, ICE used to be the INS. All these daily streams, whether big or whether small, there he is again. Us on a stream and us on a stream and you 